Okay, welcome everyone to this uh, open DAS Lab group meeting. I'm Johan Andresen and I'm a joint postdoc in the DAS Lab and the lab of William Greenleaf in the genetics department at Stanford. And I want to take uh, the opportunity today to sort of give an overview of what we've been doing so far with all the switch puzzles in Eterna. So I'm typically the one who takes the data. So I'm going to try to summarize uh, the puzzles we've done and the results we've gotten and also try to point out a little bit where we're heading in the months ahead. So um, some of you may have seen some of these slides before, but I thought I'd give a short introduction also for any new players who have joined recently and, and who has, haven't seen these before. So what we're very interested in is now to make RNA designs that perform logic or can switch uh, in the presence of certain ligands and to make more smart RNA molecules and um, than the static designs that were part of the original Eterna game. And the reason we want to do this is because we think RNA is very powerful uh, in that it can accomplish many different um, activities. So here you see two drugs uh, that have entered at least clinical trials. One of them um, uses RNA as a ribozyme to cleave another piece of RNA. And in the other one, the RNA is forming an aptamer uh, that binds to uh, a VEG F receptor. And both of these are great, uh, but they're a little bit like um, blunt tools. You take a hammer, you knock something out, or you, you inhibit an enzyme in this case. But what we want to do with Eterna is really to take this from as a tool to something that's a bit smarter, like a, like a robot that can take inputs and sense what's going on in its environment and then act uh, upon that. And to give you an idea of what this could be like, um, Imagine you have a sensor that you want to make, and this sensor would just turn on a fluorescent molecule. The first way to make it a little bit smarter would to in introduce, let's say, a complementary sequence that turns off the sensor unless uh, you have a microRNA present in the cell. So here you have one input that turns on an RNA molecule. You can also make this more complex by adding, for example, a small molecule aptamer. Uh, that would bind a small molecule like a drug or some other metabolite in your cell. And then only in the presence of both of these uh, would you turn on your gene. This provides a double control, one that's sort of intrinsic and one that you, you may be able to control um, by adding the drug or eating the drug. In this case, um, let's use aspartame for example. It's, it's not a drug, but it's just one example of what a small molecule may look like um, that can be bound by an aptamer that's selected for. What I just showed you was a very simple um, design that represents um, a logic gate, in this case, an AND gate. So an AND gate uh, only turns on if both of the inputs are true. But there are many other combinations where um, you have two inputs that provide an input, an output. So if either of these inputs were true, we would have a so-called OR gate. Or if you only wanted to up the output to turn on when one of them is present but not the other, it's an XOR gate. And players of Eterna might have seen all of these recently um, as puzzles, and we're currently conducting data for such basic logic gates. Now, in the long term, you can even imagine making very complex um, structures where you have many inputs and many outputs. Uh, in this case, it's just a notional example of what an 8-bit adder would look like. And there's actually a Feynman grand prize that um, awards um, a prize if you manage to make a molecule or any device that can perform this calculation in a cube that's smaller than 50 nanometers on either side. Uh, clearly, this is uh, far away, but we've been very encouraged with what we've seen so far for just basic logic gates. So maybe sometime in the future, we can tackle something like this. Now, Eterna is perfect for trying to push the envelope of how much logic and combinations you can do within RNA. And it's because it provides sort of a platform for all the important parts of the scientific method. So as all the players know, um, all the designs are made online by a lot of people who have many different ideas, which lets us explore 
different possibilities and generate new hypotheses. And then we take all of these designs and test them in the lab. Uh, and that's, that's typically me with the help of a lot of people in the dust lab. And then we take all the data, we fit the data to get relevant parameters out, and then we return all the data again to the players. And this last step is actually maybe the most important one where uh, players are allowed to browse um, among the solutions and try to find patterns or come up with good design rules that are predictive in how these RNAs will fold. And there's also now a strategy market um, on the forum that I encouraged everyone to sort of jump in and, and don't hold back. Some people are very prolific, which is fantastic, and we, we'd like to see even more. And then what, of course, we want to do is to take all of these rules and incorporate them into some kind of algorithm that can help us um, design de novo RNAs or help the players make even more complex structures. So in the DAS lab and also the whole Eterna development team, we've been trying to improve all of these four sections. Uh, a lot of players have probably seen updates to the gaming interface recently. Uh, a lot of it's thanks to the, to the great work of Nando. We've also been trying to increase the throughput and accuracy and fidelity of the data collection itself, uh, as well as finding better methods to, to get accurate fits and better statistics for, for the data that comes out. And recently, we also recruited uh, Ome, a player, another player developer, who will help us, uh, hopefully, to improve the... Um, the browsing interface for the solutions later on. So it becomes easier now that we have so many designs to, to extract useful knowledge out of it. So I will touch mostly on the experimental parts today, um, but um, you will see very interesting developments in the gaming side as well in the future. So how do we actually make this switch in Eterna? In contrast to the static designs where you actually get base pair information, um, the method we have chosen now is not a base pair resolution one, but rather a functional one where we look at binding of other molecules such as fluorescent proteins or fluorescently labeled RNA oligos to tell us uh, which state uh, a design might be in. So the, the way we started with was to use a well-known aptamer for the small molecule flavin mononucleotide or FMN. Uh, and as a detector, we've been using a fluorescent labeled MS2 uh, viral code protein, which might be the best characterized RNA protein of all times. So that's a good starting point. It has a very well-known um, binding um, and affinity constant. And we have previously done work in the Greenleaf lab to characterize it very, very well. Um, the difference, though, with having a fluorescently labeled protein is that you only get, um, you only measure uh, the state where this hairpin forms uh, through the, this binding here. So the, you might form the MS2 hairpin, which is one of the two states in this switch, but you only measure it um, sort of as a secondary readout by flowing in more and more fluorescent labeled uh, MS2. So this changes um, the data a little bit, but I will show you how we treat it and how we score um, the designs. To get, so bring everyone up to speed. And just to show a little quick example of what it's like to design a, a switch in case people haven't done it. I, my assumption is that most players who are watching this have, have done hundreds or thousands of these. But the idea here is that you have uh, two different states. One, um, the one to the right, is a state in the presence of the small molecule FMN, which you see there um, in the middle of the circle. And to solve this switch, you want to, first of all, stabilize this aptamer so it forms uh, when the small molecule is present. In this case, I did it by making base pairs uh, on both sides of it. But you see, now we have the same structure, or the same predicted structure in both cases. So what I did is I changed a few base pairs, and um, now I get two different states, or two different predicted structures in the two states. And what you could notice was, if I only changed one base out here, uh, you go from having two different states to identical ones. So it's probably a really bad switch, but it shows you um, sort of the process of going 
um, about this problem of, of designing rival switches. So one, one thing you can learn immediately is that it's not the most stable state and sort of the lowest energy that might be the best because for, for it to be able to switch, you need to be close in energy in both of the two states. So that's a big difference from the original Eternam design puzzles. So once a player has designed um, a, new, a new switch, uh, I'm going to go through basically what happens after that point. So we collect uh, all the designs at the end of this cycle, typically at the end of the month. And then we take all the sequences, convert them into DNA sequences, and add small flanking regions. So if you look at here, the variable sequence is what you design. This is a long piece of DNA here. So what you design is the blue part, and what we add is a part of the yellow and green parts in a piece of DNA. So we send a long text file to a company that synthesizes uh, up to 12,000 different sequences on a small chip. Then they take all of these sequences and put them in a test tube and send it to us here at Stanford. And then we go through several steps of PCR to first uh, enrich uh, the original pool. Then we add a lot of extra sequences that would help us generate RNA. So this is, includes an RNA polymerase promoter sequence. And a short sequence where the RNA polymerase can stall and hang out for a while. And then we also need some adapters at the end to be able to sequence, as well as a barcode. So we know um, which molecule uh, it really is, so we can, we can get good statistics on it. So we do that by second step of PCR with five pieces. And then now recently, we started to do what we call a bottlenecking step. For this step, we take um, our, our sample from here, and we dilute it. Um, a lot, so we only get a few hundred thousand or maybe a million unique molecules in the test tube. And then we do another round of PCR to amplify this product. So what happens now is that even though you have many molecules in the test tube, they all came from a small pool um, of sequences. So you, what you do is you get multiple copies of every original molecule, and they all share the same barcode now. So we, we can pull them together and reduce sequencing errors. And we also ensure that we get many copies of each, each design. So once that is done, we sequence all of this on a small benchtop sequencer called an Illumina MySeq, which is the sort of a workhorse sequencing instrument these days. And once that is done, we end up with a chip that has been sequenced with many small, what we call clusters, that represent different DNA molecules. And the trick that they figure out in the Greenleaf lab is that you can take this chip now and use it as a, as a basis for generating an RNA array that's very, very dense. So when we get the chip back, we can strip all of the sequencing chemicals off of it, and then we end up with unique single strands of DNA, like this one, which corresponds to the original designs that we have made, where the blue part, again, is, is the design made by players. So what we do is we hybridize a small DNA oligo at the end with a biotin at the end of it. And then we extend it with a DNA polymerase to make it double-stranded all the way. And we flow in what's called streptavidin, which binds very tightly to this biotin. And if we have this here, the RNA polymerase will not be able to go past this point. Instead, it will just stop there, hang out, and leave it the RNA hanging out. And to make this happen, what we do is we flow in RNA polymerase, which is represented in this green molecule here. It binds the RNA promoter and starts transcribing RNA. But what we do is we starve um, the solution of one of the four nucleotides. So there's no C in the solution, I think. Uh, which means that the RNAP will stall at this yellow sequence, which allows us to flow out all excess RNA polymerase. Once this is done, we can add all the four nucleotides the RNAP will extend from here, start chugging along the DNA, and generate a single strand of RNA that um, is still bound to the RNAP at the very end of the process. So now we basically have our design, or the player's design, as a piece of RNA hanging off of this RNA polymerase. And we can visualize it by hybridizing small molecule um, 
such as RNA oligos or MS2 in this case for the original ribose switches. And there's been some, some confusion I noticed among the players when we talk about clusters. So what I showed you here is a single DNA molecule, but in practice, um, through a process called bridge PCR, all of these original molecules are amplified in an area localized around them. So we end up with 500 or maybe 1,000 identical DNA molecules in the tight clusters on this surface. And each of these generate one RNA molecule that can bind an MS2 protein. And so what, when we're talking about our signal, it's the total signal from this entire cluster. And the number of clusters also matter. So one cluster is probably not enough to get a good accuracy. So that's why this number of clusters that I keep mentioning is, is an important parameter. So have this in mind. This is what we're always looking at in the microscope. And just to show you an update on the barcoding strategy that we had done, uh, what we ended up with in round 97, which was the most recent one to have data published, um, are these data. So now, instead of having many designs with only one or two uh, clusters on, on the chip, you see there are very few clusters or very few designs with only one cluster or very few clusters. Most of them have at least a handful or 10 or a dozen, uh, which greatly improves our accuracy. And the average now is 72. And for every barcode that I mentioned, we get about a dozen clusters on average. So that means that we can pull all of these 10 or 20 clusters together to get an accurate sequence out. So we eliminate sequencing errors that way. Unfortunately, for round 97, we noticed that we actually lost uh, a lot more sequences uh, due to this um, bottlenecking step. So we're trying to improve on that, and we apologize for all the players who didn't get their, I guess, favorite designs uh, actually characterized. We're trying to always improve on it. So hopefully it will get even better. Now, going back to what the data actually looked like, here's uh, an example picture of um, this the RNA array that we have generated. So each of these dots in red represents that cluster I showed you in two slides earlier. You see the clusters are sometimes different size. So they have different numbers of sequ sequences in it, but we can normalize using this R all RNA signal, which is just the oligo hybridized um, to the RNA. And what we do then is we flow in increasing levels of MS2 And once we hit about 10 nanomolar, we start seeing binding as these green dots that show up and are overlaid on those red spots previously. And as we increase the concentration, more of these clusters will start binding MS2 until uh, many of them reach saturation. But notice that even at high concentration of MS2, there's some clusters here that don't show any binding at all suggesting that all of these molecules have a different conformation that does not expose this MS2 consensus hairpin that we use as sort of a readout signal. And one more thing you can notice is that this figure here, or this image, is very, very dense in clusters. So it allows us to uh, gather about half a million uh, or a few hundred thousand unique binding curves for every, every image like this. And we have about 16 images for every experiment. So there there's almost a million data points each time that we collect. So once this is done, um, players will be familiar with this plot, hopefully. Uh, this is the, the data that's reported back to players. So each of those dots that you saw with increasing MS2 uh, is fit uh, individually to a binding curve. And here I just show the, the median curve, but each cluster is actually fit individually at this point. And what's important here is, is the parameters that we call F max, which is the maximum intensity of this binding signal. But foremost, it's this uh, parameter called KD, or the dissociation constant. It basically represents the concentration here at which um, the binding signal reaches half maximum. So that's the KD. And it represents how tightly the MS2 binds. So a lower KD means better binding. And for switch, what's important is to shift this KD to much higher value. 
because it means that somewhere in the middle you will have a lot of binding at a certain MS2 concentration for the on state when the switch is on, but very low binding when the switch is off. So the bigger the fold change in KD, the bigger this relative difference is between on and off for switch. So those are the kind of qualities we look for in, in a switch. What you see here is one of the highest scoring switches so far uh, by Eli Fisker, uh, which is a microRNA switch where the microRNA binds the entire design in one long piece. Presumably, that gives it a lot of uh, energy that can shift the equilibrium. So what we do is we fit every single cluster, and we give back a histogram and the median value. And so the full change in the median value between this one and this one gives you the full change in KD, which is the important parameter for the switch score that I will explain shortly. Also, it's good to know that it falls properly. So that's the Fmax we also return to the players. And just to remind everyone how we do the switch score, um, and also the full eternal score, because the, of this design where you have a secondary binding of MS2 to the hairpin, um, it turns out that the higher your KD is for your baseline, so your on state, the easier it is to get a big full change in KD in the off state. So what we did is we designed this baseline subscore, which is, ensures that the KD in the on state is very close to the MS2 hairpin, so the native hairpin. And then the switch score is a measure of how much this KD shifts overall. And to make sure we have a design that makes any sense at all, we also incorporated this folding subscore, uh, where you get maximum score if, if the intensity, median intensity at the maximum a concentration is is above a certain threshold. So all of these three combined uh, makes the Turner score. And here's another way of looking at it. So if we plot the KD in the on state versus KD in the off state, you want to have a really low KD in the on state and a really high KD in the off state. So you will end up in this corner. And you notice that there are a few really good switches even uh, in the second round that we did a long time ago. But most of the designs at least initially ended up close to this line here, which means essentially no switching. So our goal is always to move up towards this quadrant here to get good switches. And to give you a sense of what the results normally look like, um, here's an example from round 96, uh, which happened a few months ago. Uh, I always return these data to the players um, to give sort of summaries for every single puzzle, but also for the entire round uh, in general. So what you'll see immediately is that you have two big peaks at 30 and 60. Uh, these represent uh, clusters that just got a good folding subscore in the case of 30, but didn't have a good baseline or a good switch. So it's not really a good switch, but a lot of them end up there because most of them fold correctly. The second big peak you see is around 60, which mostly represents something that has a good baseline subscore and a good folding subscore, but doesn't switch. So it binds MS2 well, uh, and you see it well enough, but it, it doesn't switch. So it's a, it's a good starting point, but it's too energetically stable in the, in the on state. This tail is what we really care about, which represent good switchers. And it sort of mimics uh, this long tail you see for the switch subscore, which occasionally it gets all the way out here, which is halfway to the thermodynamic maximum that you can get based on our calculations. And recently, to make sure that this thing, um, the subscore and the total score are consistent, we started repeating the same experiment over and over again with about 1,000 designs that we collected from round 88 and 93 and 95. So now we spike this in every time, and it allows us to compare round 96 and round 95. What you can see is there's a very good um, correlation between the scores. There is some, some spread. Uh, but mostly, I think, hopefully people can see by eye, most of the spread is due to very low cluster numbers. So that it, again, brings us back to this number of clusters that is um, bugging us. So if you have 100 clusters, uh, reproducibility is, is pretty good. If you have one cluster, you can go a little bit anywhere. But the RMST is around uh, 6 to 8 in, in these previous rounds. And we hope to improve it a little bit more. 
but that's about your spread. Somewhere between a five and 10, that's how well you can trust your Eterna score at this point. And some of that is, again, just due to experimental variability due to the number of clusters. So this brings us now to all the different puzzles that we've been doing over the past year or so in Eterna. It's been very exciting to see the, the progress. Uh, and I'll try to summarize it a little bit here. We started um, with a few on and off switches using FMN as the trigger. Uh, I'm going to start with off switches. So in the first round, uh, in the pilot round, which was round 88, I think, and also in the second round, round 93, we had four off switches termed exclusion one to four. And these are very similar in that they have a locked MS2 hairpin and also a locked aptamer sequence uh, somewhere, somewhere in the design. And they differ basically on the position of the MS2 hairpin, which is far to one end for exclusion one, and in the middle for these two, and at the very end on the other side for exclusion four. So it's four different topologies, basically. The exclusion two and three has the hairpin in the middle of the two strands of the abdomen, which are here and here, but on different sides. So it gave the players a few different things to, to try to optimize. Later on, based on player inputs, uh, we made a couple of more puzzles. The idea was that if the re relative position of the hairpin and the abdomen really matters, we should have more options. So the first ones we made were exclusion five, where the hairpin is right in the middle, but far away from either aptamer sequence. Exclusion six is very similar to exclusion four, um, but there's a little bit of gap between the hairpin and the aptamer sequence. And finally, Brewer's mod of exclusion four is just like exclusion four, but it has more sequence um, at the very end of, of the design. So those are the different puzzles that player have been very successful at tackling. So here's a, I guess, a big summary slide of, of what that looked like for each design uh, across the different rounds that we've been doing. So we have done this in a total of four rounds. The first one uh, had very few designs. And it was the first time we ever tried it. And as you notice, the scores were, in general, um, pretty low. So not a lot of switching happened, but um, provided a good starting point. Then in round 93, when we finally enabled uh, the 10,000 designs, we got some, some good hits. There are a few data points up here, but, but there's definitely a big improvement from 88, which was great to see. Uh, and then for round 95, again, we added these additional puzzles. And it was good to see also that even for the first time these puzzles were attempted, um, they were in general better, at least than round 88, and comparable to round 93 here. So, Maybe the biggest mistakes have, had already been learned at that point. It's good to see player progress. I think it's, it's clear by eye that some of these puzzles get progressively better for each round, suggesting that there is some learning going on and some hypothesis testing. Now, this is just a, an aggregate, so it's not clear if, if players always try to get the highest score or if there's a lot of experimental things going on behind the scenes where just a lot of different sequences are tried to find the best ones. But I think even in this aggregate, it's, it's encouraging. And if you read the, the forums where there's a lot of uh, interesting discussions going on, it's clear that just some of these topologies um, are harder than others. I think players in general find exclusion two and three um, much easier than exclusion five or exclusion one, for example. And that I think the, the learnings we've been drawing so far is that th there is really an, a good position for the hairpin relative to the aptamer. You don't want them to be too far away from each other. But what, what, what was also clear from, from reading a discussion on, online is also that different topologies may have different optimal strategies. So there's not necessarily a unique strategy for solving any switch puzzle. So it comes down to what the, what the specific relation is between the hairpin and the aptamer. So we, we hope to learn even more. And also, we started trying this with Eternabot um, to hopefully tease out when, when certain strategies are better than others. So example strategies might be you want the whole sequence to switch all at once, so the full switch, or you just want to keep certain parts 
static and use a, a small part of the sequence to actually do the switching. And that might depend on the on the topology. So we're still actively looking into this, and we, we really appreciate all the players' inputs to that. Now, you again see here, for every round, there's this huge peak around 60 and 30 that I explained previously, which um, shows sequences with only binding or no switching. But what I would say is that we, we have declared success, I think, for this one. We think that after this fourth round, there are plenty of, of sequences that reach 95 or more, which was our original criterion. Um, so that's good to see. And given all the interesting puzzles coming up, uh, we will not be relaunching this puzzle um, for now. That's not in the plan, unless players really want to. So we're curious to hear your feedback. And here just showing two examples of some high scoring puzzles for exclusion three and four. Some of them have this multi-loop uh, junction with other or more so just longer hairpins with some mismatches. So there's definitely a big variety in, in what the puzzles look like in the predicted structure. And also to show that these switch scores are not just random chance. So let's say you got just a big spread and some of them happen to be positive and some happen to be negative, you would get a long tail of switch scores no matter what. Here's an example of what the actual full change looked like for the exclusion two puzzles uh, in terms of round 98. Seven, and you can see, clearly see that most of the puzzles end up on the to the right of one, which means that it's um, switching in the right direction. So we're definitely not looking at noise or just large numbers. There's there is uh, a great tendency to have switches going the right way. There are of course some some that go in the wrong way, but that's part of the process to figure out why why they do that. And then in, some t in the same time as we did the exclusion puzzles, we also did the same state puzzles, which is on switches. And these turned out to be easier, I think, for the players overall. You can see that both of these puzzles, one which has the hairpin at one end and one that has it in the middle, yielded plenty of high scoring designs already in the second try, but especially in the round 95. So we actually declared success for that already at round 95, which was um, interesting to see. So it might be that just turning on uh, a switch is easier for some reason, or it might be that we have slightly mis misjudged the energy of the FMN binding, and, and that has shifted the way people see the puzzles in Eterna. Um, so we hope to, to try more of these uh, same state puzzles um, going forward. And again, here's one of the highest scoring designs. In, in this case, a lot of the structure is static between the two different um, designs, showing that you only need a, a part of the structure to do the switching. So the next step that we, we did was to make these puzzles that are much more flexible. We call them the next generation designs. And I like this because uh, now the players can put the MS2 hairpin wherever they want, so we don't have this sort of artificial constraint of where we are. And Nando was great. He added this stamper tool, which I really like. And you saw here, we can just um, choose the stamper and put the MS2 uh, wherever you want. Um, so that was great. We launched um, and analyzed and so tested one round of these next generation puzzles already. And I think you can clearly see already that even if the um, horizontal scale is different, there's already like very high scores, especially for the same state already at the first round. So I think this increased flexibility uh, helps, and the players have hopefully learned from the few rounds before then what to do. But again, you see that there's some difference between the puzzles, and it might again be that certain topologies are just harder to, to get at. And same state, which means the on puzzles, are, are easier overall. Um, I'm just in the process uh, this weekend to test the second round of this, and it's going to be very exciting to see if we can further improve on, on all of these, essentially. So going forward, if we're doing more FMN switches, simple switches, we're probably going to stick to the next generation ones just because they're more flexible overall. Do you understand what, uh, can you go back, what is the, um, the um, same state case? Yeah, um, sorry, I'm, I'm waiting for it. There we go. One of the, the, same state NG2 is the best, or got the best solutions. Where was the um, aftermer there? It's the aftermer that's switching around, the aftermer for FMN. 
Yeah. Yeah. So Regis' question was, where uh, is the aftermer placed for these different puzzles, specifically the one that scores best? So actually, both of these puzzles look the same um, in that the first one has the aftermer up uh, very close to the beginning of the sequence. It looks like this. Number two has it right in the middle, and number three has it on the other end. So it might be that just having it uh, in the middle provides more flexibility on either end uh, to do the switching. So I guess next round would tell us whether that's sort of generally true or, if it, or, or not. My guess is that you'd, it, it, it's probably harder to make a good switch when any of the elements are fixed to be at the very, very end. That's, I think, is one impression that I think that players share with me. But again, there, there's a lot of information on the forum for people to read. Um, but I think that's, that's a consensus feeling. And then, of course, the next step that you also are familiar with, hopefully, is that we were very encouraged by, by the FMN inputs. Uh, but FMN is kind of a messy molecule and very specific to this artificial case, whereas RNA oligos, like microRNAs, are very general and might be very useful. So we launched this next puzzle, which is um, the microRNA puzzle, where the input, again, is this 22-based uh, RNA oligo. That we, we call it a microRNA mimic. The microRNA is typically loaded in a, in a big protein complex and does um, cutting or inhibition in, in cells. But uh, we call it microRNA here because it's the same length and it's, it's a piece of RNA. Uh, the thing with the microRNA is that it probably has much higher binding energy than the FMN has to the aptomer. So that might explain why some of these puzzles were got very high scores um, right away. So I actually kept the same uh, full change cutoffs as for the FMN puzzles uh, to calculate the Eterna score. Um, so that might explain why, why it might be easier to do these puzzles. Both the sensor here and so this one turns on in the presence of the microRNA. This one needs to turn off. And we found that at least these two uh, worked very well already after two rounds. So we declared success for those as well. And I think I showed you this before in some previous presentation, but uh, the Eternal players definitely beat um, the Stanford students if we look at how many high scoring designs there were. The mean might have been the same, but uh, the really good ones, uh, the Eternal players definitely won out, which is cool to see. One of these puzzles, um, the turnoff variant one, uh, we thought there was still room for improvement for this one, so we tried to relaunch it again for round 97. Some of you who looked at the data might have seen that it didn't look very good, and that was just because the chip was a little bit damaged once we reused it three times for that experiment. So we, we will try that one also again, hopefully. So we, we have ordered it as of yesterday for round 99. So if you hold out for more information, you might, you might see your... Uh, your designs actually have good, accurate data down the line. But this was a good proof of concept, we thought, that you can use these microRNAs for from generating switches. And it also allowed us to sort of further explore the gaming interface, where we can use now many strands, thanks to Nando's excellent work. And we've been able to not only use one strand, but now two or, or three, so we can also use RNAs as outputs. So that's also something we're testing as we speak, actually. It's, it's running. So this whole idea of using RNA as modular pieces and combine them uh, is something we're very excited about and hope to, to expand on even further. In addition, we thought that we can also use the MS2 itself as sort of the binder or the thing that causes switching, which would lead to what we call cooperativity. So we launched this puzzle called the cooperativity puzzle we have two hairpins present, two or more. It looks kind of like a Mickey Mouse or something. But the idea is that if you have um, the binding of one MS2 to this hairpin stabilizing it, it will also make it easier for this hairpin to form and, and another MS2 hairpin binding protein to bind. And what you would expect there is instead of having this red binding curve that you normally get, you would get something that's much steeper. So it has 
what we call a hill coefficient of two in this case, if we expect uh, two ms two hairpins to, to form. So it gets sharper and sharper according to sort of the hill model of binding that looks like this. So you have an exponent n, which we call the hill coefficient. And so the idea was, of course, then to take the Turnham uh, designs and look at the binding and see if they're sharper than you would expect. And then we wanted to give a cooperativity score instead of a switch score, where you get zero if it's just one, uh, which is so no cooperativity, and you would get a maximum score if, it, if you hit uh, the theoretical maximum of two. And first, we were very excited because um, the Hill coefficient of the control was exactly one, 1 1.00, 0, I think, on average. Uh, whereas for our cooperativity puzzle, it was a much bigger spread, some with very high um, Hill coefficient. But when we looked back at the data a little bit more carefully, we noticed that all of these high scoring ones also, again, had a very low number of clusters because this puzzle in Eterna was longer than usual. So we got fewer clusters as a consequence. So unfortunately, I think the first round was inconclusive, but we have redone now the second round. Uh, the data were collected uh, last week and will be analyzed. So hopefully, with more um, higher number of clusters, we might be able to see if it's possible to design such cooperative um, designs in the future. So that's very exciting. So stay tuned for that. This is what we have um, at the moment. So um, a good, the control is good, uh, but that's all we can say for now, I think. And then finally, as you all know, we started using these multi-input switches and starting doing logic gates. And that's also an experiment that's running um, currently. And we were actually very impressed that the players could make so many um, solutions and submit so many designs. Because initially, when we tried it, we found it very, very hard. And I think the players did too. Um, but here's, here's one example of the XOR gate. Uh, so you have four different states. In the middle, you have one of two inputs. And to the right, you, you have two uh, microRNA inputs that players can design around. And so here's one, just one example of what this might look like. For this XOR gate, um, the Mr. Hairpin is correctly folded, at least in silico, uh, in either of these cases, but not when no microRNA is present or when both are present. So it will be very interesting to see if this um, pans out in reality as well. It was also interesting, this one is almost like a tuning fork where both of these uh, microRNA sequesters a long sequence and don't really bridge each other. So we will be very curious to see what the players uh, find regarding how to implement these microRNAs. And again, there were almost 2,000 designs, which was very encouraging. And it's coming soon, <laughs> which is um, in the next few weeks, hopefully. You might want to say that. Um, uh, we haven't we've had limited success in computational design for those switches in silicon. I was, I, was, I was going to mention it in the next slide. Oh, OK, great. It's coming. Um, First, I just want to mention the strategy market, which has also been very encouraging to see. There's been a lot of um, ideas um, proposed that are all um, being incorporated in Eternabot. So people in, in the Dust Lab, Michelle Wu and also Vinit, who was a, a summer student, I spent a, long, a lot of time trying to incorporate all of these ideas from the players into Eternabot, which is an, sort of an automated algorithm based on the on the player's strategies. And we, we gather all of these ideas from the strategy market. So if people haven't seen it already, I suggest you go there and, and add your favorite ideas. Some people are uh, amazing and prolific. Eli, Fisk, Eli Fisker is, uh, is very prolific. And I, I hope that um, you see that as a good encouragement for the rest of you to, to also submit good ideas. Um, and so there are many different ways of outlining these, and this is just one example I, uh, I pulled. And here, here's the Eternabot that we were talking about. Um, I'm actually going to see if I can play this um, video made by Michelle in, in our lab. So the, the Eternabot works through a, a Monte Carlo simulation, I think, where it, it 
changes some bases at a time. And if it gets better, it keeps it. Otherwise, it uh, goes back. Is that correct? More or less. Uh, OK. So here you just see um, it makes thousands of steps. And you just see sort of snapshots of how the designs evolve uh, over time. I think for this puzzle, it didn't actually solve it before the end of the video. But um, I think it did um, pretty OK for the, for the simple switch puzzles. So that, that, that is here. So for the microRNA puzzles, uh, there's definitely some successful switches. Uh, the general shape looks the same, but there are fewer high, really high scoring designs from Eternabot. And that's true also for the next generation FMN puzzles. So maybe um, Eternabot is too blunt or something right now. There's some, some small tweaks that it doesn't do, that, but that the players realize. So. Um, Maybe by refining those fine tweaks, we may be able to get Eternabot to get even higher scores. But as Reed, you mentioned, Eternabot has had a really hard time, and correct me if, if I'm wrong, with the um, multi-input switches. Um, so it's not clear yet if we have reached a point already where the players can outperform uh, the computers. Um, but we, we, I guess we'll have to wait and see if, if we can resuscitate Eternabot to the next level, or, or if we simply have to rely on players from now on. Our goal, of course, is to make it um, understandable and have a predictive rule set that we can use. Um, so taking the best from the players at all times. Uh, so that's, that's the status of Eternabot. And finally, I just want to mention, you might have seen this little picture up uh, on Eterna saying that you should get ready for winter 2015, which is very soon. So I just want to say, I'd say that we're working on um, new, very interesting puzzles where we actually try to tackle some real world problems with um, uh, cases that people want to design or where there could be a potential use of the design. Originally, we want to see if this, um, this is going to work. So we're going to try something for tuberculosis where this one sensor uh, that senses three concentrations and calculates this ratio um, could be useful to telling whether you have active TB or not. So this is, of course, even co more complicated than the simple XOR gate. I say simple. It's not simple at all. But in comparison, it's, it's, uh, it's simple. So to start with, because, because A times B over C squared is pretty hard, we're going to start with um, just uh, the puzzle we launched a few days ago that we called A over B. And the goal of this puzzle is uh, to be able to tell whether uh, this ratio is simply above a certain number. So what you see here in the orange line, and this is also explained in the puzzle description, this is the ratio that we want to, to detect. So whenever A over B is uh, a quarter, that's the ratio. And so there are different ways now, because the phase space is not just on or off. It's, it's like anywhere on this side and anywhere on this side. We have devised a couple of different um, puzzle strategies that we want to test with. The first one is just to, again, see if it's on or off as we change concentration of A. Now, this has a complication that you might just be detecting A, but have no idea what B is doing. So we hope to get around this one by simultaneously detect B as a fluorescent molecule. So we have to show that B is always present, and, and then it switches when you change A. The, al the other alternative uh, is to not have the fluorescent molecule, but try more states. So in this case, we have this three-state puzzle that you can also find online in the puzzle description, where by testing a few different points on either side of this line, you can sort of narrow in on good designs that might work across this entire range. So this is the first test, and we're very excited um, to see if this works. It's definitely yet another uh, step up in difficulty level, but players always seem to pull through. So we hope that if you will keep doing that. Uh, we've been very impressed so far. So with that, I'm, I think that's it for me. I'm very happy to take uh, questions, of course, from all the players if, if they're tuning in. I just want to end by thanking both my labs, 
and especially Redu, of course, for letting me work on this. And Michelle and Vinit has been working really hard on the turnabout that I've been very impressed by. And of course, Anne, who's been helping me preparing all the sequencing libraries each time and making sure this can be done in a timely manner so we can return the, the data to players on a reasonable time frame. And finally, John, John Nicole and, and Nando, who are our two players turned developers who are making sure that the site is up and running and that the gameplay keeps improving all the time. We, as I mentioned, we recruited Ome recently, which is very great. And uh, we're excited to see where it goes. And finally, of course, thanks to all the players. You're the ones who actually make the designs and make everything happen. So it wouldn't be possible without, without you. So with that, I'm very happy to take questions. I think people can just post them in the chat and we'll try to pick it up. So I don't know if anyone is on the chat. Can... Yeah. Uh, Elm says, do we have any analysis of what is the degree of variability between the designs being submitted, i.e. mostly mods or unique designs? That's, uh, so the question, I can repeat the question. Do we have an analysis of, of if the designs that are submitted are mostly mods or unique designs? And we actually have a new rotation student that does lab uh, Rob, who will be working on it um, as part of his rotation project, where we hope to map out the sort of phylogeny of this, see how they are all related. And hopefully that will shed some light on that, because that's very interesting. So it's not clear if, if the improving scores are because we take a good one and sort of just tweak it a little bit, or if the players are learning just new strategies and coming up with whole new designs that are scoring higher. That, that's something we're very interested in, and we, we hope to I guess, learn more. We don't know at this point. Any other one? No. It was a short notice this time. So I can, I can end by saying that uh, we will hopefully be back on monthly uh, open Dust Lab um, presentations. So next month in November, I think Michelle is scheduled uh, to give a presentation. So maybe you will see a lot more about the turnabout then, but I, I can't speak for her, what she's going to present on. <laughs> uh, but hopefully there, there will be more. So I think that's on November 10th or something like that, November 8th. But stay tuned. We, we will post a notice a little bit earlier, hopefully. Can I ask you a question? Um, you have this idea now of um, taking the top solutions, successful solutions for several of the puzzles and carrying out shape chemical mapping on them and, and working with them. And from those experiments, we'll actually be able to tell whether the RNAs are folding up into the structures that are being modeled by the players. So do you think that we're going to actually recover the same structures that were modeled by the players in silico? Do you think they'll be different? Yeah, intuition. OK, so I'm just going to repeat the question in case um, people couldn't hear it. So re what I forgot to mention was that um, for the latest round, we actually took about 600 of the top scoring sequences. Uh, so 600 in total, 650, something like that. And we, we're going to try to do chemical mapping, so Eternal Classic, on all of these to see if the secondary structure uh, represent what we see in the game. And Regis' question to me was if I think that that's what it's going to look like or not. And my guess is that 34% will look like it. <laughs> that's my wild guess. Okay. I would be surprised if they all agreed um, with what you see online. So, so there's always the danger, of course, when you design online that you trust uh, the energy models. But I think from the previous work in Eterna with static designs, it's very clear that what you see in the game is not always what's happening in real life. And I think it might be even more true when you have a switch like this. So I'm gonna we're very curious opposite. to see, though. I bet the opposite. I bet that more than 66% more than 66 66 will have matching shape data to the structures that were designed. So my hypothesis, in, bo in both states. My hypothesis is that the reasons those designs work is because they use motifs for which our energetic models are good. 
That's a guess. Okay, so just they repeat. Have Redo. To be where our the energetic model is accurate. Redo is very bullish on this. He is willing to bet uh, that more than uh, two thirds are right, um, because they do follow. The reason they succeed is that they actually follow the in silico rules. They're using certain sub motifs. I see. Two That's... junctions, three way junctions, whose energies are pretty close to what we are using in the game. Okay. That's they a good don't point. Scale because they don't. So it's a he, he thinks that they're high scoring because they do actually get the structure we predict. So maybe maybe thirty four would be for the entire ensemble, but for the high scoring ones you get higher. I mean the high scoring that's... ones. You just got the high scoring ones. Yeah. No, that's a that's a very good point. Out. Time will tell. I will tell. How about say just greater than thirty-four percent? I just I'll do the binary opposite of you. Mm -hmm. You say thirty-four. How you say thirty-four percent or less? I'll say thirty-five percent or higher. Mm -hmm. That's okay. cheating. <laughs> no, then what if it's in between? I'll take in between. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Michelle, you're in between. Fine. All right, it's recorded now. Um, people want to know more about the cooperativity. Uh, you just said, please explain more about the cooperative. Explain more. Hmm. All right, I'll I'll try again. Repeat the question though. So the question was, explain more about the cooperativity puzzles. So, um, yeah, where should I start? So typically, when you have a simple binding of one say one protein to one hairpin, you will see a binding curve that looks like this. Now, for, for many important molecules in, in life, you actually have many binding sites in one molecule. So hemoglobin is the most famous example where you have four binding sites to, to oxygen in one hemoglobin molecule. And it turns out that if you bind one oxygen molecule, you're more likely to bind a second one than you were binding the first one in in the first place. And so you basically change the molecule when you bind one ligand to make it more amenable to bind even more. So this gives you a sharper response. Again, the sharper response ideally looks like something like this. So you can go for something that where almost nothing is bound to where almost everything is bound in a much shorter range of concentrations. So this can be very useful for switches, for example, where you want you wanted to switch um, at a very specific concentration instead of just going very slowly from almost nothing to almost everything on. So you can imagine if you want something that's always on or always off, and you have two of these very sharp curves, you can get everything on or everything off within a narrow range. So that's very interesting, uh, and it's used widely in biology. And we think it could be very interesting and useful also for um, synthetic RNA designs, such as the one we're doing in Eterna. So cooperativity means first binding potentiates a second binding? You should have shown like a, a solution like for the other cases. I like should have done it. PWKR solutions where there's like four that show up all at once. That's right. Next time, hang in there. I think I, I held off on showing a lot of data because the data was not very good. <laughs> The designs were great, but the data were um, less than stellar. So yes, that's that's exactly it. You change um, the affinity for your substrate based on the binding of the previous substrate. So in this case, if you bind one MS2, you will be more likely to bind second MS2 as opposed to if you know, they were both independent. And you can actually have something called positive cooperativity and negative cooperativity. So positive cooperativity is when you increase um, the chance of binding a second one. But the negative one is, if you bind one, you're much less likely to bind another. So that's almost like an exclusion type puzzle, where you know, if you bind one, you can't bind the second one. And so for Eterna, we, we wanted to have positive cooperativity, which leads to these sharp transitions. And the idea was that people can put these hairpins wherever they want to try to, to combine them. Some, some players were, of course, smarter than we were, so they started putting in two or three or four extra hairpins uh, to get this really sharp transition. So it will be interesting to see now in the upcoming experiment if that, if that worked. It should have, but um, the data have to be good. It's very 
saying multiple binding sites for C molecule means flooding with that molecule in solution will trigger an on-off state faster or more. I think if I understand the question, um, I think that, yes, the cooperativity will, will tr have a sharper um, transition from mostly bound to mostly unbound. Um, also, I'll ask, I also wanted to know about something I heard, that we are moving towards not doing protein binding switches and instead focusing on microRNA. Is this true, and is it related to what you said about modularity of microRNAs? It's true. And and you <laughs> you can see it. Uh, it's it's the RNA in RNA out puzzles that we have been doing. So um, in run ninety eight, there was an RNA in RNA out uh, with a ten nucleotide oligo as a readout, and the one we just ordered yesterday, the run ninety nine, uh, has a longer RNA as a readout. And there are several good reasons for us to to use this. It's hopefully we're going to be able to get better data because RNA will be brighter and it will not destroy the chips. So there's some practical considerations for doing it. But it's also good because we can actually model all of these um, quite well in Eterna. So thanks to Nando's work of in introducing NewPack, which is a new model of calculating the, the structures, uh, we can now have three or four different molecules all at once in Eterna. So it, it just gives us this flexibility. Uh, so yes, I think there might be more RNA readout going forward than MS2. Uh, we chose MS2 initially because we know how it works and we, we've done the experiment previously, but there's no a priori reason why all switches in, you know, forever should be an MS2 readout. So hopefully the players like the, like the RNA readout too. It's a different kind of experiment because now everything can interact with everything else. Okay, if that's the last question, I thank everyone who listened in or who might uh, watch it later on. And we hope to see you next month for the next presentation. <laughs>